This is Tell Me What to Read, powered by Booktopia. I'm Nick Wasiliev, and today we dive into family history and tales from close to home. In today's episode, Scott sits down with Ashley Goldberg to discuss his compelling and compassionate debut book about friendship, faith, family, and identity, Abomination. Then, in our second interview, Stefania chats with Chloe Hooper around a personal tale about death, life, and the enchantment of stories in Bedtime Story. Both books contain adult themes, so listener discretion is advised. Check the show notes for timestamps for each interview, and if you are enjoying our content, drop us a review on Apple Podcasts, a like on Spotify, or wherever you are listening to our show. Now over to Scott's interview with Ashley Goldberg, author of Abomination, which you can purchase in the description right now from booktopia.com.au. Well, hello to all our listeners. I'm Scott Whitmont from uh, Booktopia, and I'm delighted today to have the role of being able to chat with the brand newly published author, debut author, Ashley Goldberg, about his book, Abomination. Welcome, Ashley, to our podcast. Thanks for having me, Scott. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Ashley is a Melbourne-based author, and uh, so he's in Melbourne, and of course, I'm in Sydney, so the wonders of technology, here we are still chatting to you, as if we're sitting side by side. Thank you, Zoom. Um, before we get going, I think I'll just uh, make one announcement in case it's relevant to, it might be relevant to some listeners. Abomination is about many things, which we'll discuss in a minute, with multiplicity of themes, but the story does revolve around a key incident of child abuse abuse at a school when the two main characters were boys and how that case affected them in their lives, as we'll discuss further. So if any listeners were uh, unfortunately in a situation where this might bring back traumatic memories or involved in any cases like this, uh, just a warning of the content uh, before you listen to the podcast and read the book, though I'm, I will reiterate that it's just a, a background to the story that sets off the story of friendship between the two, uh, two main protagonists. But I just wanted people to know that uh, in case it's relevant to you. So with that having been said, Ash, um, I'd like to ask you, you know, I love this book, which just comes out, you know, uh, 3rd of May, and um, it's got so much in it. I was so impressed with the number of themes that you tackle, either intentionally or unintentionally, in this book through the story. Friendship, belonging, identity, faith, childhood trauma, justice, ethics, acceptance, self-realization. Did, did you intentionally set out to break the record for the number of themes an author can examine in one book? I mean, well, thank you. Thank you, firstly, Scott. I, I didn't, um, I certainly didn't set out uh, to do that. I, um, I had in mind, you know, as, as we have the two, the two separate distinct narratives. And, and I think um, through uh, Ezra's secular narrative, I was able to um, explore a, a range of themes that are um, close to me and close and close to my life, you know, relationships, identity, morality, um, it, it is the contemporary idea of love. Um, and, and then, you know, I had in mind um, Jonathan's, Jonathan's uh, narrative and, you know, the, his subsequent questioning of faith. Um, so really, that's, that's what I went into the book with, with, with those two main narratives. Yeah, that's great to know. And, and I'm not surprised to hear you say that because, uh, you know, you've got, as I said, all of these themes through the two narratives shining out brightly. So listeners will be thinking, Jonathan and Ezra, who are they? Well, who's he talking about? So why don't you set the scene for us telling us something of Ezra and Jonathan, these two friends since boyhood and the world that they inhabited as schoolboys? Yeah, no worries. So so Ezra and Jonathan um, went to a uh, religious uh, primary school together in the year 1999. Um, it's a fictional uh, ultra-Orthodox school called Yahel Academy. Um, Ezra's family is, is a bit more secular than, um, than Yonatan's originally. Um, and uh, Yonatan's is, is ultra-Orthodox and quite religious. His father is, um, has a good standing in the community and is, is well known and respected. Um, then there is a certain event uh, at the school where, where a rabbi is accused of, of child sexual abuse. And as a result, Ezra's parents um, 
uh, take him from the school and, and they, they follow, go on two separate paths. Um, this is really when the narrative takes off. You know, that event's a springboard event, but um, the main, the, the context of the book is really around the two, the two boys when they're reunited as, as men 20 years later, where Ezra is an atheist and lives an entirely secular life. Um, and Yonatan is an ultra-Orthodox uh, ordained rabbi who um, teaches at Yehel Academy. Yeah. So, as you said, it's 20 years later and they meet over a, a protest about uh, this This rabbi 20 years before had escaped justice and is now being brought back to Australia after years in Israel to face uh, to face the courts. And they re-meet and uh, re-look at their friendship, having not seen each other in this 20-year year chasm. So, you, you explore, speaking of chasm, another chasm, the chasm, as you mentioned, between the secular and religious worlds. And as you said, Ezra steps away from religion. He was never that religious, but he totally steps away from an adulthood. He has a non-Jewish girlfriend, totally secular life, while Yonatan embraces the orthodoxy with which he was raised. So I thought when I was reading this, and I wonder what your thoughts are about why some people go in one direction to the extremity in faith, uh, whether we're talking about Judaism or any religion, and, and why some go the other direction, totally secular, apart from our own upbringing from our parents. I wonder what influences such decisions of faith and identity, um, you know, are in later life. Have you got some ideas on that? I mean, yeah, it is. It is so interesting. It is, you know, from my own my own upbringing, uh, going to a Jewish day school in Melbourne. And, you know, so many people that I went to school with have gone um, either way, uh, there are there are me- people from my school who are, who are rabbis today, and there are there are those that live entirely non-religious lives. Um, I, you know, I I do think uh, you know to an extent, um, it's it's obviously going to be subjective. But but one thing which the book explores, and what I was interested in exploring, is is um, you know. W- uh, basically, how much control do we have over our, our lives and the person we're going to become when we are placed on certain parts, when when certain events happen, um, uh, that may point you in a different direction to, to, to the one you were originally on. Yeah, exactly. So clearly, you know, all Australian readers anyway will will obviously think like I did when they're reading this book of the abuse cases like that, which is currently in the courts of Malka Leifer, who's just come back from Israel to face courts of, about the Sapper sisters. And then 10 years ago, the case of Manny Wax, who went public about his school abuse at another religious uh, uh, Melbourne school, the yeshiva. So both cases, of course, help and it happened in Melbourne ultra-Orthodox Jewish schools. Uh, these cases, I'm guessing, planted the first seeds for the, the book's plot with you? Is it the, all the headlines and living in Melbourne in that milieu that, uh, you know, uh, first started you on the idea of writing this book? Um, not, not, not the book itself, but the, definitely the uh, Jonathan's narrative, definitely the springboard event yeah. um, uh, that brings the, brings the boys together. You know, it, it is the, the character of Rabbi Hirsch in, in the novel, the fictional Rabbi Hirsch is an amalgamation of, of um, uh, definitely those cases, yeah. um, as well as really, you know, it's my intention that it's an amalgamation of, of effectively um, all instances uh, that have been uh you know, made available in the public, um, where uh, religious institutions have either acted or been uh, inactive in uh, holding uh, sexual abusers of children to account. I, I did live in Canberra for for four years and working for the federal government, and um, you know, had a little bit of exposure to the the 2013 Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Sexual Abuse. Um, right. So, so for me. Um, you know, and I didn't. I didn't really set out um, to write uh, th- to have the narrative really as, as uh, to have that event in the background as distinctly as it, as it is. But I do think that I had, uh, um, for me, you know, growing up, growing up Jewish, um, with uh, as, as you know well, Scott, all the um, the inherent um, morality of Judaism, um, all of the the focus on on effectively the good. Um, I do think that those events uh, had a greater impact on me than I realized and, and yeah. came, came out in the narrative. And, and no doubt that will uh, echo and 
with readers who are not Jewish too, who might have been educated at Catholic schools, and you know, there's many highly publicised instances of of this sort of thing in uh, Catholic schools and with the clergy there. So it's it won't just resonate with Jewish readers, is what I'm saying. Uh, even though it's set firmly in the ultra orthodox Jewish world, it seems really universal, and clearly you've written it for a much wider audience, whether they be you know Jewish, Gentile, atheist, whatever. Um, what you also examined was about being bullied or isolated in childhood, uh, in your formative years. It can really affect relationships and issues like trust and, and intimacy for the rest of one's life. What, what message were you wanting to convey through your characters, particularly Ezra's experience? And, and I'm not talking about sexual abuse. I'm just talking about incidences of if you're, if you're bullied or isolated in childhood, you know, not... not necessarily as traumatic as the background case we were just talking about, but just that childhood uh, discombobulation, how that can affect relationships later. Yeah, yeah, really, really interesting uh, there, Scott, because I had some early readers um, say to me, uh, effectively, to not not really understand um, Ezra's, uh, Ezra's crisis or Ezra's character, um, when with, with only those um, those incidents in in his past with with that bullying and that isolation, but um, you know I think I think this comes down to uh, what I found is a quite common response from writers when you ask them why so what why do you write why why you know what led you to writing in the first place and the, it's a quite common response to find um, them say well you know when I read when I read books. Uh, I felt less alone. I, I felt connection with the author or the characters, and you know, it made me feel like that somebody else had had my experience. And so, I suppose with doing that, um, that that those incidences and um, and Ezra's character, that's really what I was going for there. You know, my hope would be if if anyone having had those experiences um, reads this book and you know uh, can relate to that and um, understand. Uh, that you know it's perfectly okay you know and there are that there are ways forward um then then my job is done yeah exactly uh well reading abomination really made me think of other writers like Chaim Potok and his books The Chosen and The Promise uh, also coming of age novels of boys in ultra orthodox uh, world I'm guessing he inspired your writing and I'm wondering what other writers might have influenced you or been literary muses for your work apart from him, which seemed obvious to me. Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> no, absolutely. Both both The Chosen and The Promise. Just, um, the Chosen just uh, blew, blew me away. But, um, you know, as for uh, other, other writers, um, Nathan Englander's, um, both of his short story collections, more so than his novels, um, they, uh, um, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank and um, the, the, uh, the relief for the relief of unbearable urges. I think I think that's the other one. Um, you know, he does such incredible uh, incorporation of um, uh, the the blending of secular and ultra orthodox worlds. Um, and, and in terms of contemporary Judaism, uh, I think it's probably the best that I've read is, is Nathan Englander. Also, I'd say Isaac Bashev Singer, um, not his Nobel Prize uh, winner. Yeah, um, the slave, the slave, much more than, than his other works, um, because of Jacob's um, questioning of faith. There's this real, the, you know, this really, really torn apart when he's um, in love with with a Gentile woman, and um, there was just, uh, I, I love that book. I absolutely love that. I book. read it so many years ago, more than I want to admit. You're making me want to go back and read it again. He was a wonderful writer and wrote in Yiddish, actually, even though he lived in New York, had come from Europe, wrote from Yiddish, and all his books are translated. And the, yes, I, I can see his he, how he would influence you. He was a marvelous uh, uh, writer of, of the Jewish world. Um, so a question about the writing process. You expertly navigate your narrative with chapters alternating between the two boys or the two men's you know, lives and with past and present timelines. I would imagine that creatively that must have been a bit challenging to juggle. And and I thought, I wondered if you had that uh, narrative format right from the beginning of writing or, or did it emerge as you started telling Ezra and Jonathan's lives stories? I, I did have it in mind from the beginning. It was, it was actually completely um, a structural um, device um, so that I could... I uh, basically take it one step out of a, at a time. I found it so much easier. It's, it, you know, effectively, of course, both narratives do come together and there is that crossing over, but I, I you know, you could 
you'd be missing some things, but read just one of their narratives. Um, if you chose skip every chapter, every, just read Ezra's, every skip the unit. Chapter. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you could, you could do it that way. I found it, it was so helpful to, um, to write it this way. I did find with the, um, with, with the flashbacks and the moving from past and present and things like that, the, um, keeping timelines in mind and in the inconsistencies nearly drove me completely mad. Did you have a so, big chart down your wall with uh, arrows and dates? And <laughs> it's a, it's an Excel spreadsheet, but, but it's, um, it's, it's such a mess. And I, and I, you know, I said to my partner, look, if I ever do this again, I'm just not, I'm not going in the past. We're just staying in one timeline and that, that's it. <laughs> Mind you, you know, I, I could picture this as a as a TV miniseries, and it'll be wonderful. You know, f- scenes flashing back, back and forth. You know, it will work very well visually. So I think you've set it up well for that. Hopefully, there's a director out there who says, "I want to film it." <laughs> yeah, I would. I would love for anyone to film it. If, if any any directors are listening, um, yes, please, please get in touch. Get in touch. <laughs> So was it your intention to educate readers at the same time uh, about Judaism and its philosophy and practices, or was that just a, a natural offshoot of telling the stories of these two guys? I think, I think it's a product um, uh, of effectively, um, you know, being a debut author, particularly, um, this was the story I had to tell. I'm putting a lot of myself on the page, obviously not not entirely, um, but in terms of um, being being raised Jewish and the tenets and precepts of of Judaism, and well, I suppose also that it's a um, to a large extent, uh, a lot of the narrative is about adolescent Jews as well, and and my entire adolescence was revolved around Judaism. So um, I, I suppose like those those elements. Well, I certainly didn't set out to incorporate as much as I did. Um, uh, it, it's just what came out. I, I guess a little like another recent book from last year, uh, Lisa Emanuel's The Covered Wife, uh, which looks at an ultra-Orthodox community in, in Sydney in the Blue Mountains. Um, in fact, you're probably, I think you're on a panel with her appearing as the Jewish Writers Week in Melbourne, or you've got an event uh, with her. Uh, you know, her book also looks at uh, Jewish life and sheds a light on that uh, lifestyle and and tradition that many people might not know about. So I, I thought of that book when I was reading yours also. And uh, give, given how small relatively compared to, you know, the United States and other parts of the world, the Jewish community is in Sydney, I think both of you, in Australia, I should say, I think the two of you have really uh, contributed a lot to uh, the education of readers out there about uh, Jewish precepts and, and, and tradition and philosophy. So, uh, so thank you for that. As somebody Jewish myself, I think you've done a great service to, to educate, although that probably wasn't the primary goal, of course, of your book, but I think it's a great uh, a product of it. Yeah. Th- thank you, Scott. Yeah, I did. I did read um, Lisa's, Lisa's book. I actually, I, I didn't, um, I, Lisa reached out to me when she first heard, heard about mine and I immediately hadn't heard of her book. I don't know how I missed it, but I, I immediately got it and, and read it. And I was pointing out so many things to my partner. I was like, oh no, she's got this as well. And we're, we're you know, we're overlapping here. We're overlapping there. But I think, as you said, it's more of a, um, it's a very different story. <laughs> it's, a, it's a different story. And I think we're working, uh, you know, we, we've both uh, worked together to, um, to incorporate so much that, that for if a reader read both books, they would um, be enlightened. Yeah. Yes, I agree, and I recommend that people read both books. Uh, so this is your first novel, but you've written short stories and articles before. I, I hope you haven't decided I've told my story now and it's your last novel because I, I can see, you know, I look forward to, uh, and all readers I think will once they've read it, a wonderful future for you. Are you working on another novel? Tell me yes. I, I am. I am oh, working yes. on another novel. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, um, I don't know if anything will happen with it, but I am also still working on on short stories. Um, short stories are my first love. Uh, I, they're definitely my favorite form of prose. Um, so I hope one day to put out a collection as well. Well, like Nathan Englander, who you mentioned, and, and Edgar Keret writes wonderful Jewish short stories too, set in Israel. But uh, I hope you do both because uh, it would be a pleasure to, to keep reading both forms from you. Well, I'd like everyone to know in case they didn't know already that uh, uh, Abomination, which comes out from uh, Vintage, as I said, uh, 
today, the day we're recording this, uh, May 3rd, and is available, uh, would you believe, online at Booktopia or from your local bookshop, as are all the works, really, of Chaim Potok um, and uh, um, Singer, uh, we mentioned, and Nathan Englander and The Covered Wife. They're all available from Booktopia or to be ordered from your local bookshop. So I hope this podcast uh, motivates people to go out and, and read uh, you, first of all, and then all those other authors that have uh, inspired you and me uh, in the past, because they're, they're all really, really worth reading. So we wish you great success. I know you've got a appearances uh, live in Melbourne coming up and later in Sydney. So uh, at least people listening in Sydney and Melbourne can see you live. Otherwise, I'm sure there'll be many other online uh, interviews and events. And uh, we wish you great success and look forward to future uh, releases from you, hopefully in the not too distant future. Thank you for chatting with us today, Ashley. Thank you, Scott. Before we head to our second book, we have a sponsored book for this episode, and that is Good Sport by Dr. Jay Lee Nair. Are you a parent who wants to be part of their child's sports journey, no matter how far they go? Do you sometimes feel just as frustrated as your young athlete with the debrief during the journey home after the game? Perhaps you struggle to find the right words to say, or sometimes not to say, to your child, so have resorted to saying nothing at all. Dr. Jay Lee Nair has the answers. This book will help you learn how best to support and talk to your child, not just before, but during and after the game. You can order a copy of Good Sport by heading to the link in the description below as our sponsored book for this episode. Now over to Stefani's interview with Chloe Hooper, author of Bedtime Story, which you can purchase in the description right now from booktopia.com.au. Hello, I'm Stefania Caponia, Booktopia's non-fiction category manager. Today, I'm delighted to be speaking with best-selling author Chloe Hooper about her latest book, Bedtime Story. Hello, Chloe, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Stefania. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, can you please share with our listeners a little bit about the events that led you to writing this book? Sure. I, um, in 2018, my partner went for a routine blood test and he discovered that he had an aggressive leukemia and at that point our our two children were aged um six and three and um it quickly i quickly realized that we needed to find a way to talk to them about um the situation that their father was in, but also it was a sort of bigger conversation that perhaps I'd avoided around mortality. And it sounds very grim, but I, I mean, I guess um, it's an important conversation for, for parents to have with their children at, at and, and for adults with, with children in their lives to have at, at, at any point, but um and it's an important conversation because then we can start to sort of talk about life and the best way to live. But certainly we were having to, to frame this in, a, in extremis. And I went to the bookshelves and I, I was hoping to find a book that would, I guess, um, you know, explain things to them and, and, and I guess indeed to me about how to move forward. Mm. Um, so it's called Bedtime Story. Um, so can you share with our listeners what the significance of bedtime and bedtime stories is within the story of your own family? So my, my partner, um, who, who is the writer, Don Watson, um, would tell the boys uh, a story every night and um, it was a kind of magical moment in, in, in um, I guess, um, the, 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 the day or, um, you know, preceding the, the night um, when I guess the lights would go off. They'd, the kids had often had a couple of bedtime stories and, and they, they preferred if he would put them to bed because then um, the lights were off. And I think we all have that memory of, of lying in the dark and um, 
you know, the kind of a story washing over us um, in that moment before the dark feels scary, I suppose, because it's filled instead with, with wild characters and story. And I guess that it made me realise that all through human history, there's been an, an adult and a child in the dark. And it really made me think about what have been the stories through the ages, through ages of war and plague as we're, as we're in now. Um, you know, what were the stories adults told kids to, to sort of, you know, explain the dark and the light? So the book is written, um, you're speaking directly to your eldest son, who you mentioned is six at the time that yes. you're writing this, yeah. um, and it's in the first person to him, so it's quite conversational with him. So when you were writing it, was the intention always that it was going to be a personal message for him and his brother Gabriel? You never mentioned your son's name, by the way, through the book. I tried finding it. You mentioned Gabriel but not. Yeah, the big the, my, my big boy is Tobias and Tobias. They're, they're Stefania and they're now um, age 10 and 7. Oh, okay. And, yeah. Um, I just have to sort of apologise to um, listeners because um, they're they're sort of stomping around in the back. <laughs> yeah. And as you know, it annoyed at me for having disrupted the game of, of Ticket to Ride in the school holidays. To talk about them. <laughs> so he's six when you're writing this book. Yes, and you're, right. you're writing it in the first person and you're speaking directly to him. Yes. But was the intention always that it was a personal message to your sons or did you visualise or have an idea that at some point this was going to be read more widely by a bigger audience? Well, I mean, I think as a writer, um, you know, when you start to sort of, you know, uh, record scraps of what's happening around you on, on a bit of paper, um, you know, it could be for your nearest and dearest or yourself or, um, you know, there's always the possibility that it will be, um, you know, you'll, you'll turn it into something that will be more widely read. Um, I guess that, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think with any, with your uh, writer often has to ask themselves, who am I writing for? And um, I, I guess that I, I, I'd like to think that there, that there is this sort of lasting um, document that, that explains this period of, of life to them um, and that I hope will be meaningful to them one day. And, and I guess though that, you know, I think if you, if you, you strike something as a writer that, that feels important to you, that the chances are um, that it will to a wider, wider group of people, because, you know, I guess what I've learned is this is, um, you know, a big, a big, maybe the biggest conversation that um, a parent, you know, or an adult has with a child. Yes. Um, so has the audience that you pictured changed now that the book's been published? Well, um, I, I guess right because we're right at the beginning of the um, of publication as we speak. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it still feels like it's quite a personal, yeah. um, personal document. Um, and I, I think, though, um, when I when I've mentioned that I'm writing this book to 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 people uh, to to audiences at writers festivals, etc., there's always there are always people who um, come up to me because you know they perhaps um, had a parent who was ill. Um, you know, in their in their childhood or um you know this is such a common story and um we all experience it right we all experience it and yeah. and one thing I guess that was sort of you know striking to me was I mean maybe that's not you know um there are different ways I think that people might attach to the story but one of them is also looking at the the lives of um, the the author, the children's authors, perhaps yes. who are most beloved, and actually, how much um, loss was often in in their background. Yes, 
Yes. I mean, so from from the Brothers Grimm to Hans Christian Andersen to Ellen uh, Montgomery of the Anne of Green Gables and uh, Francis Hodgkin Burnett, the uh, Secret Garden, Dahl, Tolkien, C.S. Lewis. So all of them had suffered childhood bereavement. So that really started to make me think too about the relationship between um, grief and loss, but also enchantment. How in the midst of um, of pain, people kind of find magic that can see them through a difficult experience. Mm. Yeah, that was one of the most uh, fascinating parts of the book for me was this link that you found between all these famous authors and all these people who'd written these beautiful stories and what had linked them all together. Yeah. Um, Yes. So you also uh, collaborated in the book with um, Anna Walker, so an award-winning um, children's illustrator. Had you known her work before you um, worked with her, or how did the how did the partnership come together? Uh huh. Well, I mean, Anna's so brilliant and and her illustrations I think really transformed this book in in you know beyond my wildest dreams what I could have imagined um I I you know I realized that um I did have know Anna's work because her you know she's obviously published some really cherished Australian children's books and her work was on our bookshelves without me really realizing it was it was Anna's work um and I was writing writing this and I just felt that there was a moment where I wanted the reader to sort of feel that they were in a different element and it occurred to me that if the if the work was illustrated at a particular point um, you it would change the kind of feel and the tone of of the book and and maybe put put um, the reader into a feeling of being in a kind of you know meta children's book in a way and it's a kind of homage to the how beautiful a lot of children's books are how how wonderful the history of illustrated um works is and, and how rich um and I I went to Anna with the proposal and um it's so funny I'd sometimes when I'd look at her children's books I would see that you know there'd be a, a particular page and then she'd have a window and the way that Anna um, would depict weather just seemed to me to be so stunning. And I, I went to her and I didn't know that I was like in a fairy to st story, uttering the magic words, which were, I love the way you do weather. And for her, that was like catnip and she was all in. Oh. So um, as you can see, um, Fania, there's a lot of um, wind and rain and uh, sea spray and I wanted the feeling and Anna agreed of, of being immersed in a journey because this 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 was in our family and mm. a kind of um, odyssey we had to get to the other side. So um, how did the collaboration work? So did, would you give her chapters that she would then create illustrations for or did you work together on them? Because some of the pages looked so much like they had been created um, at the same time, if that makes sense. All right. Well, I'm glad that you say that. I mean, the, the book was also very beautifully designed by Alison Colpoy, who a lot of uh, fans of, of children's books will know from her stunning illustrations in in, um, in you know, books such as All the Ways to be Smart um, and... Um, you know, Alison in her own right is a, it's, you know, such an amazing talent. So I sort of was, you know, very fortunate to kind of have the, this dream team of children's book illustrators working together, um, designing the book to make it, you know, all look as though it was all meant to be together. And what something I'm proud of actually is the way that it's, um, I hope it, it feels organic to the story actually, mm -hmm. rather than just kind of, oh, that would look nice here. I mean, that they're, that they, it all has a kind of, you know, meaning that goes together. Yeah, they do. It does feel very organic. That's why I was so curious. I mean, were they a lot of, it was a lot my of, side as they were writing and drawing? I, I uh, like yes. Just, just, yeah. just their, their, their genius at the end. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, okay, so you, you mentioned in the book that you were writing this for this project and researching it at the same time that you were also completing your previous book, The Arsonist. That's right. So, yeah, so how was this experience 
different to your other books? How was this writing experience for you? Well, I, I suppose um, when when you write nonfiction, um, you're really um, you're really you you're asking a lot of um, of people, the people that you're writing about, because you know you're often, I, I guess, you know, for want of a better word, you know, intruding on their lives and writing about kind of sometimes the most traumatic and personal experiences. Um, that a community or a family might have dealt with. Um, and uh, um, in this book, I guess I turned the, the, the lens onto my own family. Um, but I actually, uh, at the end of The Arsonist, um, I, I had, you know, dealt with a, a, a really, um, um, and written about a really um, big cast of characters. And there was something that was um, perhaps a relief at the end of that project. Um, uh, before that book, before The Arsonist was published, it, it had actually been, um, you know, read by, by, the, by the police, um, by the family of The Arsonist and also by the, by the legal teams and also by the, the family of, of um, somebody who'd lost, lost relatives in that fire. So... Yeah. Actually, to, to take, um, to just to be writing about um, my own family and, and limiting it to a very sort of small domestic scale in, in another way was a, was a sort of relief, even if um, some of the aspects that I was writing about were, um, you know. Um, it was a difficult topic, right? Very, very difficult. Yes, that's okay. right. Um, in yeah. the background, there's a standoff between the dog and a, and a child who's trying to usher the dog away. <laughs> uh, it's good to hear that they're, um, they're having a great life. <laughs> no, well, well, I guess we've been very, very fortunate, fortunate uh, because yeah. their, their father, uh, you know, um, at the end of the book, yes. um, he um, is, um, goes into remission. And yeah. so, um, you know, but, but, but I guess this experience, which a lot of families go through, it, it does teach you to oh. enjoy every day. Yes. As, right. as, best you, as best you can when, when there's a, a high degree of chaos. So do you think that's given you and your family some, because um, you're in Melbourne, right? So yeah. yeah. Did, did that give you a bit more of insight or resilience during the, the hard lockdowns you had and all the other stuff that's been going on in the world? Gosh, what a, I mean, what a couple of years. And yes. I mean, the conversation about how to um, lead, a, you, you know, your best mm. life while, while under a shadow um, has never sort of seemed so, um, so timely and important. Yeah. But, but yes, I, absolutely. I mean, I, I think um, when, you've, when you've lived, you know, um, when you live in the midst of um, a, a serious illness, um, that that kind of that sort of pressure a family um, goes through, um, I think that 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 lockdown, you know, for us because you know didn't didn't wasn't so so hard, but it is co complicated going forward. I think um, so many of us are really just sort of over um, living through a pandemic, but how we protect our immunocompromised, you know, loved ones, um, you know, that's, that's, that is not easy going forward with, with, um, you know, as we relax more and more restrictions that um, it's um, certainly compl complicated. You also write in your book about children's stories and how they've changed. I think we've touched a little bit on this already, but how they've changed across generations. Um, and how they started out quite dark and then we've moved through to like these Disney type stories that are very different, right? So children, right. Are, you know, it's changed the way children see animals and nature and even how they learn the hero journeys, right? So can you share a little bit about your thoughts and what you learnt um, researching this book? Children's literature is really fascinating because it's such a mirror, you know, onto a society's values. And um, certainly children's literature historically has been been very dark. Um, and so it was um, a shock to me in some ways when I went to look for books which, which dealt with um, issues of life and death for, for, for younger readers 
and I realised that, you know, almost, almost sort of the kids' shelves were entirely um, in a kind of primary coloured palette and um, we really didn't, we really don't sort of um, talk very much to, to younger readers about um about mortality, um, we 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 you'd think everybody was sort of immortal, actually, from the way that these 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 books are. Um, but there are some, you know, there are some exceptions that are that are that are terrific. I think to kind of you know introduce a sort of different palette emotionally, you know, into to younger children's um, you know reading diet, um, which I which I talk about, but. Um, uh, also, you know, it was amazing when I realised actually that the, the shelves were, were almost, um, you know, completely, uh, anth- you know, anth- about anthropomorphised animals um, that were, you know, how many rabbit narrators yes. or, or, or protagonists we have when we, when we live on a continent where, um, you know, rabbits have done more damage to our environment than any you know, other sort of, you know, creature anywhere else on the planet. I mean, it's it's kind of this funny thing where we want to, um, you know, read these stories to our children so that they have a kind of connection to nature, but actually we're almost denaturing them, you know, you know in terms of um, the way that, that animals are represented. And... I, I think it's interesting that we um, we I mean for for all of human history, um, people have told stories using animals as a kind of vehicle. I mean, in you just look at traditional indigenous stories, you know, through to Aesop, um, and uh, but but I think the thing is that we we might sort of feel that we've taught the child the, the moral, but then we we actually our our interest in the animal is kind of um, vacated, you know, so. It's, um, I, I guess, if we want kids to, to learn from the cycles of life, um, at, you know, through nature, um, I think it is sort of, we, we do need to think more about um, some of the, the books we pick up and read to them, um, mm. you know, about the, the, we need to think about how actually we tell these stories about animals as we live through a kind of mass extinction of different yes. species. Yes. Um, so, you know, the, the book's complete. And how would you like people to use this book in their own journeys and within their own families? Uh, I'd like people. I'd like people to um, to pick up the book. And I mean, I think there are different levels to, to read it. Read it on. Um, you know, from from those who might be in a situation like that, like like we were in, um, faced with um, an illness that could go in any direction. Um, just to those who who like children's books and have kids in their lives, or 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 have an attachment to those stories they read as a as as a child. But um, basically, I, I the, the thing I'd like you know people to really come away with is a sense that actually. By talking about this, it doesn't need to be a um, a grim conversation. It can actually be a celebration of life. We can by 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 confronting this um, conversation have a better chance at thinking and talking to children a- about um, how we might lead our best lives. You know, if life is finite, um, how do we um, make the most of it? I just wanted to touch on the fact that in the book I was so excited to read about <laughs> how you'd be, you'd been um, to Booktopia for a book signing. So you mentioned us in your book, not by name, but we recognised ourselves and how we took you on a tour of the warehouses. Um, so I hope that you guys, you and your sons, um, had a, an exciting experience during a time that was obviously very emotional and difficult for you. Um, and I hope we can do it again in person. That would be lovely. Um, yes. Yeah, no, for your that. next book. 
the next project. <laughs> well, Hopiera, you're 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 amazing the way that you oh, support you. you support Australian writers, and uh, it was great fun going into the the warehouse. Although, as an author, it's also quite intimidating because you realize the scale of mm-hmm. of 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 all the books that are out there, and uh, you're you know one's own contribution feels like a, a very sort of puny in comparison to these, um, you know, huge numbers of, 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 of books everywhere. No, you, you, you float to the top, Chloe. Uh, so <laughs> there's there's, there's a, a lot. Said, <laughs> to all the girls. No, 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 you definitely do. Um, so thank you so much again for joining us today um, and all the very best with your book. Oh, thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Thanks to Ashley Goldberg and Chloe Hooper. You can find links to both books in the description below or head over to booktopia.com.au. If you enjoyed our show today, drop us a review on Apple Podcasts or a like on Spotify and let us know what you think. Or if you're enjoying our show, you can subscribe to our channel and be notified whenever new episodes drop. Links in the description. Join us for our next episode on Thursday as we kick off a brand new series on Tell Me What To Read. For our first episode of Book Chat, we welcome the one and only Dominic Knight, renowned author, journalist, and founding member of iconic Australian comedy troupe, The Chaser. Thanks for listening, and never stop reading.